Women's monthly cycle and hormone phases demand a unique change in exercise. Stay tuned because today you will discover the perfect time to do certain exercise modes and the perfect time not to. Plus, discover why endocrine system needs are often ignored and what to do instead. Hi there, I'm Dr. Krista Burns, the founder of the American Posture Institute and your host on the Sports Rehabilitation Virtual Summit. The purpose of the Sports Rehabilitation Virtual Summit is to provide healthcare professionals with clinical solutions to help athletes recover from sports-related injuries and to improve athletic performance. I'm honored to welcome our next guest expert. Hormone balancing fitness expert Deborah Atkinson has helped more than 275,000 women flip their second half with energy and vitality. She's the best-selling author of You've Still Got It, Girl, The After 50 Fitness Formula for Women, and Hot Not Bothered. Deborah hosts Flipping 50 TV, an internet broadcast, and the Flipping 50 podcast, a top podcast with over 3.5 million downloads. And she means business, specifically for health and fitness coaches. She's a TEDx speaker and the creator of the first and only hormone balancing fitness membership exclusively for women in menopause. She's also the creator of the Flipping 50 menopause fitness specialist training for trainers and for health coaches. Today, she's going to be sharing with us common mistakes female athletes make in the gym that are costing them. Deborah, thank you so much for being a presenter on the Sports Rehabilitation Virtual Summit. Please take it away. Thank you, Krista. Thank you so much for um, having me. First of all, this topic is so very important um, and we miss it a lot. I want to just address how things might be costing women, and it might be that we're costing them now in real time, and we might be costing them for their future, and I think both are really, really important, and I want to state this, that athletes, I think we want to clarify are really of all ages, so whether it's, you know, a very overzealous, enthusiastic exerciser with goals of her own, or actually someone in competition, many times women in both situations at all ages and phases are acting as if they are athletes. So I'm addressing that all comprehensively. So again, this, I've just flipped 40 years in working full-time and around all kinds of desks and, and weight benches, if you will. So having the opportunity to actually work with some of our division one athletes at a university and look at not only have them in my classrooms, but have them become strength and conditioning coaches and being a consultant for that department. I've seen some highly competitive athletes, but also have worked with age groupers for my entire career and can include myself as one. So I know firsthand what this is like, and we'll keep the personal side out of it. But the key points I want to make today is number one, the common female specific exercise related injuries. And I'll start with a broader overview, including mistakes that we all make and what happens in the gym when we go in overzealous with, you know, results we want yesterday is yesterday and what, what is most common, but how those fall and specifically what's true for females. So really getting that picture of how are they unique and different, not mice, not men, you know, not even their younger selves. If we're talking about older women, and what the missing system in exercise prescription is. And you've alluded to that already. And that is, we talk very much about the musculoskeletal system. So we're talking about the muscles. We're talking about the skeleton. We talk cardiorespiratory system, but we often leave out the endocrine system. And because exercise influences hormones and hormones influence exercise, Collectively, when we're dealing with females who have a, a lot going on in any week during the month or any phase of their life, we need and demand exercise prescriptions that are very specific to those, and we don't have them yet. So it's up to us as practitioners when they're coming to us that we deliver these and that we know to look for or to help them avoid the injuries that'll happen if they're not aware of them. The number one misuse component for fitness results, we'll get to that. I'm guessing many of you can, can know what I'm hinting at right now, but I will let you sit in suspense and then we'll come back to that. So number one, I think one of the biggest mistakes we make, especially for any sport where 
where weight, where being smaller, being thinner is equated to being faster and or aesthetics so that it's a certain look that a woman is going for fat burning exercise. And how do I, how do I do that? There's a, a lot of buzz about zone two and zone two training, but what is the difference between zone two and what is the difference between hit? It really depends who's talking. If we're talking about zone two, so I think there are two camps right now, and that's not very distinguishable if you're just coasting through Instagram accounts or you come from just one exclusive background. So depending on if you're coming from an exercise physiology standpoint, talking about mitochondria, talking about longevity and what we're wanting, that physiology in the zone two being discussed is actually rather high compared to if you're an endurance athlete, you're an endurance coach or a strength and conditioning coach, the zone two that we're talking about in those two camps can be very different. And I think making that distinction is not, not um, put out into the public enough. But one of those zone twos is like, recovery exercise after really hard workouts. The other, when we're talking about longevity and mitochondria is much more like 80% of VO2 match, which is just short of high intensity and in interval training. So it's at a very much higher peak and that's not high enough to help women get used to clearing lactate, which is what we really need. We're already fairly good at using fat for fuel. So we can get ourselves into trouble and over exercise by spending a lot of time in that quote unquote zone two, which is that we're breathing fairly hard. We really know we're working. We can talk, but we don't want to. That's the feels like. And we really need instead highs and lows. We need that base of that recovery. I can, this is my all day pace. I can talk, I can carry on a conversation. I'm okay to do it. And we need that complete breathlessness. And we really do better with this bipolar kind of exercise, if you will, than if we spend time in that middle ground. That's a difference between males and females. So that's worth looking at because we need to look at what reduces and what increases cortisol. That's what it comes down to because as females, whether it's a female between 20 and say 50, when she's still in those reproductive years, and some would say 50s, a little bit late, but 40s to 50s, a woman in perimenopause is still going to be a little bit more um, having a cycle may not be as regular, but she's still kind of declining. She has some of those reproductive hormones, but she's becoming more susceptible to negative effects of stress and or that cortisol hormone. Certain weeks of the month for that woman who's younger, but certainly overall for women who enter perimenopause and beyond that, She's got to be careful about the exercise load that she carries, the burden and the tipping point for her in terms of exhaustion, where cortisol is rising, which we know to be a catabolic hormone breaking down muscle, the opposite of what an athlete wants. And we've got to look at what increases it, what reduces it. So generally that lower level exercise, when we're talking cardiovascular exercise, will help to reduce cortisol, help to flush out lactate, help to encourage and enhance recovery, not doing muscle damage. But what increases it will be spending too much time too long in that cortisol elevating way of steady state, but at a higher level than is sustainable very comfortably. So it's that out of breath, I could talk, but I don't want to place that really women have really less business being in. So this is kind of by definition, looking at it when we're talking about the uh, physiologists and what they're discussing for zone two being the holy grail right now of trending exercise. 
you know, the breath is both nose and mouth, but primarily becoming mouth breathing. You've got to open your mouth to take in deeper breaths. You could talk, but you don't really want to. You're not that possessed to. And it feels like it's sustainable, but you know you're working. This is not just coasting and going for a leisurely ride. It's not the same as cyclists or triathletes, multi-sport athletes would have thought of as Zone two, this is a recovery ride. It, they're two very distinctly different things. So where we get this wrong is fat burning exercise. And the obstacle for a lot of women and female athletes really fall into this more than we suspect because they can be very body conscious, whether it's because they want to run faster and they think being lighter will help them do that, or it's because the uniform that they're in actually promotes them being more thin and, and having that aesthetic the obstacle to burning more fat is often cortisol. So if cortisol is still present and an obstacle in the way, we can't exercise at a state and exercise ourselves away from that or out of it. We've really got to slow down. So a woman could have a Ferrari. She's driving. That body has the ability to do this and go fast and burn fat. But if she's got so much cortisol, actually, she may find that this backfires. And a lot of athletes do, especially endurance athletes, when they're doing too much without enough recovery. So whether it is overtraining or it's under recovery, cortisol is generally the culprit. So taking a good look at that, because again, that's where muscle breakdown occurs. This is where it gets good when we're talking less about endurance activity. And we're talking more about let's get fast twitch muscle fiber involved so that we've got reaction skills. We've got the ability to move left and right, moving laterally, not just forward and back as in daily activities. We've got reaction skills, no matter what age, what athlete this is, we need these definitely necessary skills to include in every weekly routine. But there may be times when they are more likely to be risky than they're beneficial. So looking at specifically women who are still in a regular cycle or even an irregular cycle, just much harder to predict when she will be likely to be injured if she's irregular. But in about um, in day 10 to 14 of a woman's cycle, day one, starting with she starts to bleed in that ovulation period, when estrogen is highest, women tend to have several things going on. Number one, they're actually very prone to um, enjoying better benefit from strength training. They're going to benefit more from working on maybe heavy lifting, working on power, that component of speed with it reaching muscular fatigue, even in an endurance lift, but they're going to benefit because their muscles are primed with high degrees of estrogen. Estrogen is a muscle stimulant. And that's a perfect time to fit in a few or two. If it's a shorter period of time, we're talking, maybe they can fit into with enough rest and recovery between really high quality strength training workouts and benefit from them. The thing they also have going for them is rigid tendons. High estrogen tends to cause rigid tendons. And so basically what you've got is a really strong foundation in order to lift those weights. What we don't have, because estrogen has a lax effect on ligaments, is stability. So this kind of movement in and out and weaving through cones, ladders, any of that lateral movement quickly reacting to maybe balls in a racket sport, for instance, could be far more risky because of the lax ligaments that we've got. So we know that for women, uh, shoulders, ankles, knees, and they tend to be different in the way that other um, genders or men in particular get injured, but those are highly risky joints for them. So looking at lateral ankle sprains, you know, there is some research suggesting that this is not a great opportunity or a time to be doing agility types things. doesn't mean we can't do hit. High intensity interval training may be perfectly fine, 
but you'd want to do it in a safer environment, say on a bike, you know, a spinning bike, doing something much more linear in nature as opposed to fast moving. So always remind everybody of this, and we don't want to scare any athlete away from lifting, but we do want to cover the bases when it comes to what injuries are most prominent for them. So no, no lifting or not lifting is far more dangerous than lifting for an athlete or for a non-athlete for that matter. But there are about 450,000 exercise injuries annually. And this was from 2022. I don't think the results are quite in from 23, but that was an increase of 11% from 2021. And in part, I would say just interpreting very quickly that that's both good and bad. I mean, we never like to see injury rates go up, but if that's because exercise rates also went up and we're going to see a small portion of, you know, very uh, high risk exercisers who are the ones getting creative in the gym, we're going to see that happen no matter what. But the largest group of injuries happen between 15 and 24 year olds, as you might guess, mostly young men probably trying to impress each other and one up each other. But the second largest group, I don't love this because it's 25 to 64. They've just lumped all adults, really, except for older adults, all into one group. And there are fewer injuries to adults over 65, probably because there are fewer Adult over 65 lifting weights. It's a very small percentage. You and I probably know them. And so in our small own bubbles and circles, we feel like that's not true. But we just happen to know the majority of those people who are exercising is generally the key. So in looking at where the most injuries occur, Shoulders, elbows, vertebra, and the knees are the most common injury areas. So when we get female specific, we find that for the shoulders, it's multi-directional instability in females. So that means it could be because of internal rotation, external rotation, it could be a subluxation. There could be any number of things going on for a female. So number one, shoulders are vulnerable. The um, elbows, vertebra, they're still there, but not as common. The knees and the lateral ankle, as we talked about, the agility is probably where that happens. It's not necessarily happened during the gym activities because those are fairly stable. But when we're, you know, moving quickly and boot camps and agility ladders and really some circus moves are a part of what goes on in boot camps and training. I think you've really got to be on top of what was happening. What are you doing? And be asking for sure. The knees in females, two to eight times more frequent ACL tears in knees. And, and I'm preaching to the choir here. You certainly don't need a reminder of this, I'm sure. But Part of that is the Q angle. Looking at females to males, we've got, you know, greater risk simply because of the build. It's not a stable house, you know, like a, a male body is. But again, coming back to those knees, we've got to look at, are there specific times when the knees are more prone? And again, that ligament laxicity between day 10 and 14 approximately, is when that estrogen peaks during ovulation. So there are a lot of good things happening. There's a lot of great training that can happen during those periods of time. But I think you would want to watch for anything that's causing, you know, a female to feel vulnerable, to um, come away with constant aches and pains, and just have a heightened awareness of this could be, you know, a sign that we really need to change the training, let's emphasize during this week, you know, strength training, keep them on board with high protein. That's also going to play into that really well. There's rigid tendons going on. We need strength. We're always going to need that, but maybe not, you know, doing rapid directional changes under high force, certainly because of that ligament laxicity. So there are three things, three components that make a unique, a female unique. And that is obviously the hormones. She's got a dozen more to worry about than males do. The skeletal structure is different. When you add together the two of them, we've got real vulnerability here. 
The biggest contributing factors, and I'm going to show some exercises and forms that are probably most commonly done, but most commonly done wrong or incorrectly with poor form. But we're looking here, if you look at all of these from the literature, it's overuse, it's short post-exercise recovery period, there's poor conditioning in exercise body parts, the frequent use of heavy loads, so really no plan, no periodization, potentially always driving, always going, and the improper technique, of course, is going to be bad. But when we look at the common denominator here, it's rest and recovery, one of the most underused components in a fitness program is is recovery and it's potentially more important for a female than for a male um so something to to look at there this is something that i like to remind everyone of as a strength and conditioning coach when we give a balanced workout, which I think a lot of online trainers are really diving into at this point, but if we apply a balanced workout to an unbalanced body, we're going to increase the imbalance. And I think this is often overlooked, that the assessments that are given prior to starting exercise are really very limited in terms of, are we assessing individuals? Are we just creating programs, uh, a workout of the day and getting those posted. So I think diving into what's happening and what was the underlying cause, what was going on. So number one, let's talk shoulders. So shoulders, the internal rotation is really the problem in exercises because where we're more likely to have problems posturally already being here is internal rotation. And where we're likely to have issues, even though females have that multidirectional, it could be from any type of motion, overdoing internal rotation with exercise just more chronically compounds postural issues that most females have. And in really younger females have this worst of all. Generally, the maturation level and the speed with young athletes, with young women, teens, early 20s, came a lot faster than their male counterparts. And a lot of times that causes a female to grow up like this because she's taller, she's more self-conscious, and we've got internal rotation going on posturally. Now we've got computers and we've got phones. And so when a woman is doing shoulder work, like an upright row, very common exercise, and it's often still thrown out there. I've actually thrown it out, out a long time ago, and I don't love it. I don't love it, certainly if it's a fixed object, whether it's tubing or it's a kettlebell or it's a bar, a little bit better to control if it's dumbbells, but I personally don't use it. I prefer an overhead press. And if I'm going to do overhead press, don't always do that with a lot of women over 40. And there are younger women that I choose not to do it to either. But this is really common to do a more military press style. So again, we've got issues going on with potential impingement at the shoulder. This is one of those exercises we're seeing a lot. We're seeing it all over in influencers channels and it becomes this is something I should be doing so changing it doing it seated number one so you're not worried about arching of the back but number two bringing the elbows in front so that the impingement risk is far lower and doing one arm at a time so now we've got better spinal control we've got better ability to keep the shoulders depressed and lighting, lightening up the weight. So it's significantly lighter, saving that exercise for last. And so it feels like I'm still doing something. No matter what age, I think a lot of women feel still they need to be doing some of this work because of this. Everybody's traveling a little bit more again, putting things in the overhead bin and it's going to happen. But whether this is dishes on the top shelf of a cupboard or it's throwing in a sport or it's swimming in overhead work for a lot of sports, it does need to happen, but it needs to be done much more safely. Probably one of the other trending exercises that we see right now is just it's having its heyday, and that is a deadlift. 
And so one of the things we're seeing is this image here on the left where the over, you know, overzealous range of motion is pretty dramatic, especially for potentially her limbs. But that extreme range of motion makes every young athlete feel like this is what it should look like for me. The deconditioned body parts, if we've got someone who already has too much time sitting and then they're coming in and off the field, off the bench, and they're doing a lot of exercise, high hamstring pulls are actually very common. And that kind of eraser insertion, you know, where it begins is problematic for opening this up. So I think First of all, with this one, I see this most often in that extreme range of motion, less so when we've got somebody who's not doing a straight leg, but is bending the knees, heels are down on the floor, they're using the glutes. And I love this even more if we start in an upright position and we come down to a range of motion where they're feeling it in the glutes, but never in the lower back. And I think it's also important to realize that sometimes for many athletes, what they really need is power in a push off. They need that foot powering the ground behind them. And they may need only the 20 to 30 degrees range of motion, not the full range of motion to the floor. So I think it's looking at what's the benefit of this directly for the sport and the power or the strength that they literally need. And many are doing just following monkey see, monkey do, as opposed to looking at where do I need, why am I doing this, and what is the purpose of it? I think coming back to that is oh so important, especially for females. Back to the shoulders here. So we could talk both squats, knees, um, and we can talk upper back in this image. So a lot of times we see we're loading the spine here, which may or may not be an ideal. I would prefer at this point in time, 40 years under my belt, based on the injuries I see and the upper back and the spine cervical issues that I see in women, I tend not to load the spine anymore, even with athletes. And instead, I'll put them in a seated squat machine and have them do heavier lifting for the glutes, the hamstrings, the quads that way. And we load posturally in other ways, but not loading the spine heavily. We see a lot of knees dancing around, feet are caving in. And because of flat feet and the minimal shoes, not necessarily giving people the support that they need. But we've also got the shoulders cranked wide open here. So when we're in a back squat, which I would prefer over a, a, a front squat. So that's not all that bad, but we've got the shoulders extremely open and we're putting more pressure on cervical spine, which also is an issue. So tech neck, you know, looking on the right side, much better posture on the left, but we still have that shoulder wide open and that um, anterior portion of the shoulder is just a little bit more vulnerable than I would want it to be for any athlete. The lap pull down is one more that's commonly done wrong. So we're looking at pulling it right to the front, underneath the chin, to the clavicle potentially, but not behind the back. Great posture, leaning back slightly and causing a little retraction, which we can all use today and certainly athletes um, as well. So just other pictures of it and looking at, are we able to sustain the shoulders down? So one of the things I think we get carried away with, especially with athletes, just a little competitive everywhere on the field, off the field and in the gym is lifting more weight as opposed to lifting the weight that they're doing with really good form and the ability to stay depressed through the shoulders as they're pulling that down because it is possible to internally rotate when that weight gets too heavy and we see it often. Elbows were an issue, not really a key issue for females, but I do want to throw it in here because we see a little bag borrow and steal with what I call puppy paws. So a woman pulling something, but instead to grab that last little inch, she will subconsciously just pull this as opposed to bringing it back any further. We've got really great form here in the image, but when it when that goes wrong, often we see the domino effect and the pain generally occurs at the elbow. So tendonitis in the elbow or um, tennis elbow, golf elbow often happens to people who don't play simply because of this in the weight room. 
So there's a little bit more to it and that comes back to the rest and recovery. So this is where most think this is about between workouts, the rest that happens between the workouts, but there are so many places to be planning rest and recovery. So it's not just between the workouts, but it's literally between the sets. It should be based on the goal. Are we working endurance? Are we trying to work on hypertrophy? Are we working on strength and power? And it should be also based on experience and a moment in life. So looking at needs for females who are 20 versus for 50, we're going to see something very different in terms of recovery needs. Looking at between workouts, there's really no significant difference between two and three times a week frequency of strength training workouts. So we're talking that would be total body. So there, there often comes a time when if you're also doing sport practice, you, you really have to emphasize the sport itself and the skill itself and the strength training should be there, but only for injury prevention and not to wear out the athlete. But that's probably a good argument for twice weekly strength training getting total body, which actually is a better metabolism boost, but also allows the time for recovery. And we have to remember that 48 hours in science and literature was a minimum. It was never the recommendation that it be 48 hours every 48 hours is rest at least 48 hours. Nothing wrong with 72 or more if needed. So twice weekly, Total body, 72 hours. It significantly reduces the time obligation that it takes time and energy. When you're talking about an athlete, we want them to get rest. It's a significant part of their performance level. So it also optimally increases their capacity for effort, whether it's the sport itself or the lift that comes to benefit it. So just a kind of a refresher for preaching to the choir here on what we're talking for recovery when we're talking endurance range we're probably talking about those athletes who are endurance athletes and or working on gait or working on something like a swing for golf and what we want is about 30 seconds for so minimal recovery between with strength five to eight reps is a rep range and we're looking at two to five minutes of rest and recovery for that with hypertrophy gaining lean muscle mass, which might happen in the off season, for instance, more than anything else. Then we're looking at 30 to 90 seconds of rest or an average of about a minute just to be easy. So getting these things specific really needs to happen. And I alluded to earlier, the rest needs to increase. If it's a novice beginning of the season, potentially, or it's a novice coming out for the first time, they need a little bit longer rest and recovery. Someone who's older needs more rest and recovery. Obviously, you couple those together even more so. And then potentially premenstrual. So when fatigue sets in just a little bit more for most women, there may be more reason to take a little more rest because not only is that fatigue a greater issue, but obviously when we're tired, none of us functions really well and injury risk is greater. So being fully recovered probably doesn't hurt results any and certainly decreases the risk of injury. So it's putting together the frequency, the sequence, the sets and repetitions so that the rest and recovery can be there. We still can get a very effective and efficient workout without a lot of standing, certainly without a lot of scrolling happening in between. So looking at proper exercise technique, first of all, making sure that it's well understood. What is proper technique, including range of motion, sequencing for the rest and the efficient use of time, getting a weekly plan for recovery between hard workouts and or hard strength workouts, and overcoming anabolic resistance in females, planting that seed in their 30s so that in their 40s and their 50s, they're not losing muscle because they've got great training habits already. References are all here for everyone. Deborah, thank you so much for your amazing presentation. I have tons of notes over here as a summary, then a couple of questions for you for implementation. Right. So you talked about when it comes to making mistakes in the gym for women, it can cost them now and in the future. 
You talked about fat burning exercise, zone two versus hit. So we're looking at mitochondria and longevity is high for zone two. Zone two can have recovery exercises. And then that 80% of VO2 max need for clearing lactate. So women do better with the bipolar exercise from breathlessness to being able to continue breathing. And then what reduces cortisol? So catabolic hormone breaking down muscle, lower level um, aerobic exercise. What increases cortisol? Too much time in cortisol elevated exercise when you're feeling out of breath. So with zone two with the breath, it's nose and mouth talk, but don't necessarily want to, you're able to talk, but you don't, you don't have to, or you don't necessarily want to, and then mm -hmm. feels like sustainable work. And with fat burning exercise, the obstacle is cortisol. So we need to slow down. A woman can go fast. You gave the Ferrari example, but if too much cortisol, then this can backfire and overtraining or under recovery. So it can either be training too much or not allowing enough time for, for recovery. And then agility and reaction are necessary skills, but there may be times when they're more risky than others. You talked about a regular cycle. So when ovulate with ovulation, when estrogen is highest prone to, in, um, injure, prone to enjoying strength training. So muscles are primed with estrogen. So it could be a muscle stimulant, rigid tendons, um, create a strong foundation, but we also for lateral movement can be more risky due to lax ligaments with high estrogen. And so you want to avoid agility exercise during those periods. And not lifting is more dangerous than lifting. I think that's a, a beautifully stated because um, women especially can be intimidated perhaps by lifting, but not lifting can be worse than lift. It is worse than lifting. And then 450,000 exercise injuries occur annually, which is an increase of 11%. Largest group, 15 to 24 year olds, mostly young men. And then the second largest group being 25 to 64 year olds. So that really does lump together the adults, but recognizing that your adult patients who may be restarting exercise plans, um, you know, they could be prone to injury. And most injuries are going to be shoulders, elbows, spine, and knees with females, multi-directional um, instability of shoulders. And the knees are two to eight times more frequently to have ACL tears than men and then lateral ankle sprains. And if we look at the Q angle, females have greater risk um, of ACL tear with less stability. And when estrogen is high, it's a good time for strength training. Poor time to make rapid directional changes under high force because of ligament laxity, need to have high protein. And um, with women, it's hormones plus skeletal structure. So we have two things to consider, not just the skeletal structure, but also the hormones. And contributing factors to injury include overuse, short recovery, poor conditioning, frequent use of heavy loads, improper technique. And recovery is very underutilized. A balanced workout applied to an unbalanced body will increase the imbalance. And then this is another beautifully stated, just a, a nice clip takeaway there that a balanced workout applied to an unbalanced body will continue to increase the imbalance. And that's really where we come in because it's, it, there's more to just scrolling the internet to find an exercise. It's about understanding what your body particularly needs, because if you're applying a balanced workout to an unbalanced body, you're going to continue to increase that imbalance. And you gave us some really excellent examples of how we can prevent injury. So for example, with shoulders, um, internal rotation tends to be a problem with females, um, posture problems um, from this internal rotation, and then overdoing internal rotation compounds the postural issues. Overhead press, instead of doing an upright row, is a better solution. And the patient could be seated with elbows in, in front, and do one arm at a time. Extreme range of motion of a deconditioned body part, so for example, deadlifts, can lead to high hamstring pulls, make safer by flexing the knees, having weight in the heels, start in an upright position, and then there's power in the push-off. And avoid loading the spine for squats um, and use a seated squat machine to avoid overloading the spine to prevent neck and um, spinal issues. And back squat is better for the shoulders as well. So we're not cranking the shoulders. And then lat pull down, pull to the front, lean back slightly. And we want to sustain the shoulders downward. And then um, last but not least with elbow injuries, it can be more susceptible with pulling. And there's more to it. There's also rest and recovery. So between workouts and sets, but also, so between workouts, but also between sets. And that's going to be based upon the goal. And two and three times a week show no significant difference um, twice per week for total body and total body eight times the metabolism boost as the body part split. 48 hours was a minimum, not a recommendation. Another great point there. That's another just quick takeaway that I think was um, really profound that when it comes to recovery, 48 hours is a minimum, not just a recommendation. And so reassuring, especially athletic patients, that they're not being lazy, quote unquote, if they are mm -hmm. allowing themselves that recovery time. 
And then prioritizing that endurance range, uh, 25 to 28, strength 5 to 8 reps, hypertrophy 10 to 12. And rest um, needs to increase for older patients, for novice athletes, and premenstrual. And then frequency, sequence, sets, and reps, and recovery time are all important. And so support with proper technique, sequencing, recovery plans, and overcoming anabolic resistance. Deborah, so much value in this presentation. We're so grateful. And thank you for um, addressing a very specific you know, athlete, which is the female, um, which can be commonly lumped together with male athletes in the research. And we forget to include the importance of the hormone in the cycle for females. A um, couple questions for you. So when it, it comes to lifting weights, particularly for a female patient, they may feel particularly strong at certain points in their cycle. Um, is this an indication of when they should be lifting more weight? So this, let's say they've been training, they feel like they're about to hit a plateau, they want to increase the amount of weight that they've been training with. Is there a particular time during their cycle where it's more efficacious and less prone to injury to increase the amount of weight while working with weights in the gym? I would say so. I think they're probably going to find in that ovulatory period that adding weight, feeling like they've got that that little boost that we've all felt that you go into a gym, you're just having a really good day. Those are probably more likely to fall during the ovulation. Definitely. And I think you know, overall, if you are have a background in strength and conditioning, it's it makes sense. I mean, we need periodization, and and is there probably no accident that we're talking periods and we're talking periodization? It's you know that's not accidental. And so you you can't. The one thing we can't predict or control is game time. So we can't necessarily control when a competition occurs. And say, okay, we want to get them ready. And so we're going to be doing heavy here and or heavier overall months, you know, or periods of time. We can't always control that. So it's going to go with, you know, with the flow, if you will. But yes, in general, I think when you're off season, you're in between season, those are great times to really focus on what's happening. And, and every woman is a study of one. So I think you've got to also go with what's true for you and be open to, you know, not every athlete on your team or that you're treating is going to be reacting or responding exactly the same. Absolutely. Very individualized. Patients aren't textbooks, right? They come in and they have their unique presentations and we have to honor them for that. And that's where it gets fun and exciting too. And then another question for you, working with older females, and let's say that they were athletes up through 20s, 30s, and now they're, you know, um, perimenopausal, and they want to get back to looking skinny, moving like they used to, but perhaps they're at a, they have different goals at this point. How do you address those goals of staying fit, but recognizing that we may not be able to go back to where we were in the past and reaching those same levels? How do you address goals with those patients and then start to design the proper workout schedule for them? Great question. Really great question. And always a really great and fun challenge, depending on the personality that you're working with. But one of the things that they've got going for them that I emphasize is they have muscle memory. Even if it's been decades dormant, that will come back. So a person who has a history has a neural component there. They have that recruitment. They have the ability and the patterning still there. That motor skill is there. So unless there's been, for some reason, some damage, they've got that to fall back on. So I think it's looking at what are your goals here going forward and trying to eliminate or eradicate the words from somebody's vocabulary. I want to get back to where I was, you know, really looking instead for where are you right now, you know, and looking at what are your goals? What do you want to do as opposed to how you want to look? Um, you know, when a woman is training for something, something she wants to do, do an adventure she wants to have, something she wants to go and be able to see. Those are much more motivating kinds of training plans than how I want to look. Where are you now and what do you want to do? I love shifting the conversation to that. And then it becomes more goal and objective oriented instead of just subjectively, just how you look um, with a certain outcome. 
That's wonderful. Thank you, Deborah. And as we wrap up another great session today on the Sports Rehabilitation Virtual Summit, I'd like to acknowledge Deborah for her excellent work in sports science and personal training. And to all of our viewers, I'd like to acknowledge you. Thank you for your commitment to helping your athletic patients perform at their highest level. I'm Dr. Krista, your host of the Sports Rehabilitation Virtual Summit. Be sure to give the Sports Rehab Power Pack for on-demand access and simple implementation into your practice. Stay tuned and we'll see you on the next Rehab Masterclass for the Sports Rehab Rehabilitation Virtual Summit.